Okay, officially, welcome to the Free State Foundation's 14th Annual Policy Conference. I'm Randy May, President of the Free State Foundation, and uh, welcome back. This is uh, uh, the first conference that, uh, w annual conference we've done since the pandemic, of course. I see some regulars here in the audience. I know many of you are regulars. So some of you will recall that when we did the 12th annual uh, Free State Foundation Conference on March 10th, 2020, we did do one last year, but that, that was virtual, the 13th. But when <clears throat> we did the 12th, March 10th, 2020, by that evening, we, and we had a great crowd. Uh, the room was full. We were beginning to do some elbow bumping at the time. Uh, it, there weren't masks, but by that evening on, of March 10th, 2020, things had pretty much begun to shut down in D.C. And I think that the Free State Foundation Conference was one of the last uh, events, uh, with at least with a crowd that size that was held here in the district and in some parts of the nation for a, for a long time. So we're back again. I want to welcome uh, as well our uh, C-SPAN audience. We're pleased that once again C-SPAN is covering uh, this Free State Foundation conference. We're always excited when uh, we have C-SPAN with us, and I, it's still true that I'm a C-SPAN junkie. There aren't many people, when you ask them what's your favorite television channel, they say C-SPAN, right? Well, there are some, but, but I've, been known, I've been known to do that. Uh, as usual, we've got a terrific lineup of speakers in our sessions today. You'll find the agenda and all the bios and the brochures that you have at your tables. So I'm not going to take time and, and go through uh, the sessions, uh, but they're all, they're all there. I want to remind you to tweet. I know some of, some of you are uh, inveterate or, or maybe, maybe addicted tweeters, and that's, that's good. Uh, but we welcome all, all tweets, uh, and uh, the hashtag is FSFCONF14. I've always, when I say that, it, it doesn't sound like anything that would be recognizable, FSFCONF14, but uh, please use that hashtag to tweet away if you're inclined. I want to reiterate uh, something that I said that's actually in the welcome letter that's in the brochure in front of you. So you'll be able to, to read it, <laughs> but I also want to read it because it's important to me and it's important to the way that I think about the Free State Foundation and the way that I, that I would like for all of us, if possible to think about the way we operate today. I said in the brochure, at the Free State Foundation, we un unabashedly proclaim our commitment to free market-oriented principles, along with the respect for property rights and the rule of law. But we have always valued and respected the opinions of others with different perspectives. Today, that's more important than ever. So our goal at the conference is to stimulate discussion and through civil discourse, perhaps even move a few steps closer to reaching consensus. Unfortunately, in my opinion, respecting the opinions of others with differing views is not quite as respected or tolerated today nearly as much as it should be. But here at the Free State Foundation, we are going to continue to try to think clearly and speak freely while supporting the rights 
of others to do exactly the same. And as we go through the program today, you'll hear from uh, people with differing views. Uh, that uh, doesn't just happen by happenstance. It's because I always make an effort to try and make sure that that's the way we uh, run the program. Now, before we get started, I just want to say thanks to Kathy Baker. She's our events coordinator. Uh, it's also not happenstance that these <laughs> events come together like uh, this. Uh, I want to recognize our team at the Free State Foundation, uh, Seth Cooper, Andrew Long, Andrew McLaughlin. Andrew McLaughlin, uh, excuse me, Andrew Long, uh, uh, got stuck on a plane and called me late last night on a tarmac uh, uh, that wasn't a plane, wasn't able to leave, and he's not going to be able to be, uh, be with us uh, today. We have two members of our board of directors that are here, and I appreciate their service. Ken Howard and Ken Kane are here. You don't actually have to be named Ken uh, to, be, to be on the board, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm pleased they're here. And then finally, my wife, Laurie, who many of you know is usually here. She wasn't able to be here because of a special family situation we have. But, uh, you know, it's fair to say, it's actually more than, more than fair to say uh, that Laurie played an important role, too, in helping us put the conference together. So uh, without further ado, we're going to get started, and uh, I'm going to ask the um, first panel, uh, they, really these, these are uh, commissioners and a former acting chair, so it's, it, I sh there should be something more exalted that I should say other than just panel, but our, our uh, commissioners to come up, and uh, we're delighted that they're going to kick off the program. I'm delighted you're, you're here, and uh, you know, don't don't forget to tweet away. Thanks. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here this morning, this early morning. And uh, now that the coffee is kicking in, we are going to come at you right off the bat with a powerhouse. Uh, group here of uh, high caliber speakers, participants. I will exalt this panel if, uh, even if uh, they didn't get an exalted intro before this. And I expected a good, incisive, uh, sharp conversation, thought provoking, thoughtful in all ways. And uh, all things broadband, and who better to speak about broadband policy than uh, those who make a great deal of our broadband policy and certainly implement many of the details. And I'm talking about commissioners of the Federal Communications Commission. Um, all of our panelists today, all of our speakers are uh, FCC commissioners, present and past. I am going to give an abbreviated introduction to each of them. Many of you, of course, know them, uh, simply so we can dive right into the issues and, and discuss the, the um, issues at hand, the hot topics in communications and broadband policy. So um, I'll start here with, uh, in the middle is Commissioner uh, Nathan Symington. He was confirmed as an FCC commissioner in 2020. Prior to that, he served as a senior advisor at the National Telecommunications and Information uh, Administration. Um, we have also Mignon Clyburn, who is a distinguished uh, former FCC commissioner having served uh, a significant tenure going from about 2009 to 2018, including service as acting chairwoman of the FCC. And prior to that, she served uh, for a career of spanning 11 years at the South Carolina Public Services Commission. And today, uh, she is the principal of MLC Strategies. So thank you for joining us again. And closest to me is Commissioner Brendan Carr. He was, has been an FCC commissioner since 2017. Uh, prior to that, he served as general counsel of the Federal Communications Commission. So uh, 
thank you all for, for being here. And, and Commissioner Symington, I'm going to start with you. I think one of the things that we're proud about here at the Free State Foundation, and I don't, don't think we'll ever let you or anyone forget, is you gave your maiden speech at a Free State Foundation event. And uh, you've been on the commission now for about a year and a half, about. Um, how would you describe, how, how is it going? Are the relationship, how are relations going and, and, and the operations day to day? Well, you know, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my colleagues described this as an era of good feelings. And I, I, uh, not, to, uh, uh, not to name any names. And I, I, think there's, I, I think there's a lot of accuracy in that description. Uh, the Congress gave the FCC a number of important mandates to deliver on in 2021, and, and obviously at present. Um, I think that Congress, uh, you know, uh, I'm open to correction on this front, but I think Congress is reasonably happy with how we're doing on those. Um, we've, we've pulled together um, across partisan lines to ensure that the, the agency's business gets done timely and in according to, uh, with, uh, according to Congress's will. Uh, we've drilled down into a number of problems and uh, started opening up new areas for regulation. Um, I think it's been a very productive period. Yeah, Commissioner Carr, do you have anything to add on that? Now you're at a 2-2 a split. I mean, how, how, is it, how do you think it's going? No, it's going really, really well. I think uh, at the FC, we're getting a tremendous amount done. We've done an unprecedented you know, $24 billion worth of low income uh, affordability plans that we stood up from scratch. That's been a really important uh, work. We've had, you know, there's been events at the White House touting the agency's work on that front. We've boosted competition, including uh, in the cable market, in the, what we call the MDU or multiple dwelling unit environment to boost competition there. We've conducted a successful auction uh, of 3.45 gigahertz spectrum. So I think it's going really well. I know there's a lot of uh, talking points about a year and a half out there that says the FCC is, you know, deadlocked or gridlocked and I think the staff would have a very different perspective of the pace of, of the work that we're going at at the agency. So it's been going really, really well, 2-2, uh, and, um, and we'll sort of take it from there. All right, well, Commissioner Clyburn, um, it's been a couple of years since you've been on the commission. Could you just bring us up to speed of, of what, what's going on uh, with you these days and MLC strategies? We'd be glad to hear. Well, thanks for having me this morning. Um, if I had to describe it succinctly, which of course is not my nature for those um, who, who know me, I will say that I'm doing the same thing except in the private sector. Uh, what you are seeing and feeling and the reason why the 2-2 the uh, is, is not dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> I might prefer 3-2, but the uh, reason why it's not uh, you know, dysfunctional is that uh, for once, um, honestly for once, uh, everything is pointed in the same direction. Uh, Congress uh, has made it clear. Uh, the pandemic uh, sadly has reinforced um, you know, what's important. Um, you know, what we need to do in terms of uh, connecting uh, these communities. And, um, and, and we're just, if there's any tension, it's attempting to smooth the edges, you know, to, to better um, define or, 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 or focus on how many footnotes do we, we need. But the big global omnibus picture is, is very clear. And so I, I believe that's one reason why, um, you know, things are, uh, are, are working reasonably well. But if I didn't say it uh, before, I prefer 3-2. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll stick with you for a minute, Commissioner I think, I think everyone prefers 3-2. It just depends which is the 3 and which is the 2, but yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, <laughs> Congress has passed uh, laws authorizing several uh, significant, significantly funded broadband deployment and adoption programs. Uh, what do you see as the... Is, is there a secret sauce or recipe, or what, what do you see needs to happen to make these things successful? What do, you, what do you, do you have some big picture? So I will be careful, since we're in the press club, and say, when I say sharing, right now I mean sharing of information. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it uh, they have agreed, meaning all of those agencies, you know, to, to share uh, information when it comes to uh, technologies, maps coverage, uh, which um, ISPs are receiving funding. And I think that's important um, because one of the tensions um, coming into this was how we're going to cobble and how we you know, will uh, ensure that uh, efficiencies are being realized. And I think one of the main ways we can do that is through uh, um, you know, that information being in a, a very uh, uh, workable sort of clearinghouse uh, manner, you know, put together uh, that way, where all of it's on the table, so I know who's here, I know who's there, that, that helps with deployment, again, it helps with efficiency, and it helps, honestly, when it comes to ensuring that these programs are as waste, fraud, and abuse free as possible. So I, I, I think uh, 
I, I think that's the biggest thing for me. I think if I always pick a word of the day, as you all know. And I think the biggest one that uh, I think will guide and govern us would be sharing of information, but sharing subscript of information. Okay, now Commissioner Carr, in testimony uh, before House, I believe it was House Oversight Committee recently, you gave some testimony about uh, these programs and, and the, the agency coordination situation. So we have like the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, you've got through that the, the BEAD program, Broadband Equity um, Access and Deployment program that's allocating over $40 billion uh, toward broadband. And meanwhile, you've also got, you know, the Treasury Department is, is in on this. This seems something, seems kind of new through the American uh, Rescue Plan Act. And you kind of express some concern about agency coordination. I mean, could you kind of encapsulate that here or bring us up to speed yeah. uh, since then? Well, Seth, thank you for the question about Twitter and Elon Musk. I've um, been very hesitant to get into that and, and talk about it, but uh, <laughs> if you insist, I'll, I'll go down that, that path. Um, I'm happy to get into. To your question, you know, look, we're, we're really in an unprecedented situation in this country. You know, getting the political will uh, and machinations behind, you know, the dollar that we need to actually end the digital divide in this country was a very big challenge, and it's one that we have overcome. We now have, for the first time that I'm aware of, significant federal resources, enough federal resource to actually eliminate the digital divide in this country. Now, the hard part's over. The exceptionally difficult part is still to come, which is implementing those programs. And I remain very concerned that we do not have the right policy cuts in place and the right coordination across agencies to effectively get those dollars into the ground connecting communities, both from an infrastructure access perspective. Obviously, there's many components of the digital divide, including affordability. I actually think we're doing a pretty good job on the affordability side. But when you step back, you know, we've got the $65 billion that you mentioned. But from my count, if you look across all the agencies that have been given federal dollars by Congress over the last 18 months or so, or otherwise budgeted within those agencies, that could be used for broadband infrastructure. It could be used for other infrastructure, but it's eligible for broadband infrastructure. By my count, it's over $800 billion. Some estimates have said we need about $80 billion to end the digital divide in this country, maybe $40 billion to get to 98% of the country and another $40 billion to get to the last 2%, which just gives you a sense of sort of the, the long tail of costs for you know, ending the last couple portions of the digital divide. But in any event, if you assume the number is $80 billion, we've got 10 times that amount of money that's already been appropriated or budgeted for the agencies. And I'm very concerned that we're going to flash forward a couple of years, the $800 billion is going to be gone, and we're still going to have a significant portion of the digital divide that we didn't close. Over a year ago now, um, I think a year and a half ago at this point, uh, July of 2021, I sent letters to all the agencies that you mentioned that have funds, Treasury, Agriculture, Education, Commerce, and I just asked a couple basic questions. You know, one, you know, how are you distributing these funds? What, you know, maps or other data are you using to distribute the funds? You know, are we fully coordinated? Um, half of them never responded, and that includes significant numbers of follow-up, you know, emails, hey, just making sure you got this email, uh, no response, or yeah, let's talk, you know, schedule a date, and then say, hey, we gotta reschedule it. So I, I call it getting hit up with the, hit up with the, the okie doke. Yeah, yeah, okay, we'll meet, we'll talk. And so that gives me a little bit of pause. And then the, the answers that I did get didn't really give me a lot of comfort either. You know, I don't think we're using um, a single map, which we at the FCC should get done the maps. We can drive all these funding decisions through that. And is that gonna be this fall? I, I called for it last fall, but I'm, I'm happy to do it this fall as well. Okay. Uh, Just be asking. Good. Yeah, it's a, it's a Makes challenge. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think number one is on the policy perspective, apart from the coordination challenge, I think we still have, um, one, we have to prioritize unserved. And these are communities that have zero megabits per second over zero megabits per second. There's still too many of them in this country. And I understand the desire to get everybody to gigabit speeds. I understand the desire to get, you know, multiple uh, choices uh, for your broadband dollars, but we have to elevate and prioritize those communities that are truly on the, the wrong side of the digital divide. We've got to prioritize there. I don't think we're doing that across a lot of measures, in part because we're defining lack of service as potentially places that have, you know, almost 80 over 20, and we're treating them the same from a prioritization mechanism as those with zero over zero. That makes no sense in my mind. So I think we've got to prioritize unserved. We've got to get the maps done. Um, you know, we've got to continue to grow our workforce to get these uh, builds done. We've got a shortage on the tower climber side. We've got a shortage on you know, fiber splicers. We've got a shortage across the board. Um, I've been working to try to address that, you know, ones and twos here, standing up community college programs to 
grow our tower workforce in particular. Um, and we need some infrastructure reform as well. Because if we're just pouring $800 billion out there without further streamlining, we're basically just jumping on the gas and the brakes at the same time. We want these dollars to actually go into the ground connecting communities. So I think there's a lot we can do from you know, unserved, better maps, expanding workforce, um, infrastructure, and also supply chain. You know, we have issues obviously across the economy with supply sure. chain right now. Okay. As you put this money into the economy, it is gonna take up a lot of uh, the resources that are really necessary to, to complete these builds. So right. a lot of things that we're unsure of that uh, map, you know, the, ma the maps will, um, you know, uh, make more clear. But as you mentioned, when, we, when it comes to unserved area, areas and, and, and quite a few uh, underserved areas, we know where the problems are. I am, uh, this is me speaking personally, not uh, on, with my business um, hat, I am a fan of uh, deploying and concentrating on those areas where we know um, you know, there, there's this tragic uh, disconnect and, and divide by way of infrastructure um, is. But I also, and you knew I was going to say it, um, you know, I'll, I'll start with a point of agreement and then I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll get to my natural uh, place, um, is um, that's not all of it. You know, the infrastructure to me is the defined easy part. It's the rest of it that um, in terms of connectivity, the other three programs, you know, if I were to look uh, at the FCC and, and the other initiatives uh, that um, interest groups have been talking about, that's where we need to put, um, do a better job of putting our thumb on the scales. Build it and they will come, you've heard me say it, is not a guarantee. It is not a guarantee of um, you know, ubiquitous connectivity. So we have to keep mindful of that. So I don't want us to get all fixated on fixed, <laughs> um, you know, in, in terms of infrastructure, the rest of it matters too. All right, now Commissioner Symington, uh, we've heard maps come up a couple of times here. I mean, how important are, are these going to be or, or will they be, how important will they be going forward? I mean, do we get one-time maps that give us a picture? You know, we've heard we might get them this fall or very definitely this fall, we'll get broadband maps of areas that are covered or not covered. Uh, would those go out of risk going out of date right away? I mean, we have a lot of money coming up. That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly the right question to be asking, Seth. And I think, you know, the, the thread uniting what we've, uh, what we've heard from my uh, colleagues up, up here is uh, the importance of, on the one hand, communication, communication among agencies for effective coordination, and on the other hand, um, oversight. The two go hand in hand, and they, and they join at the point of mapping. So I think what's important is that the FCC is not just delivering maps, but also a mapping framework. That, uh, that can continue to be updated and that continue, continue to serve as a resource across all levels of government. Now, BEAD does something quite interesting. BEAD allows a program to be tailored to the specific needs of a state. And every time I look at the specific needs of a state, I find something unique. It's expensive to drill in Florida because, of, uh, because coral wears down drill bits faster. On the other hand, Florida's flat. You know, some states have a very lumpy geography. Some states have, uh, some rural states have highly concentrated populations in a small number of villages. Other rural states have widespread populations across farms. Every state is a unique challenge, so BEAT is attempting to address that. And of course, we need to have an extremely comprehensive mapping framework in order to address that. But what that means is the mapping framework coming out of the FCC has got to be valuable to the NTIA. It's got to be valuable to the state governments that are in the process of delivering and implementing these plans together with the NTIA. And then and there's got to be a constant feedback process. Um, this is, we've, we've put an unprecedented amount of money out there. I think we've, um, frankly, I think if, if, uh, if technology had not moved on, everyone would have been fine with 25.3. Now, now we expect high quality streaming video and we expect it two ways in order for people to work from home, to be educated at home, to engage in telemedicine, et cetera. So the, the target has moved and, and that, that forces us to figure out how to fit past programs as well into the current outlay. I mean, that's, I think that's you know, part of how you get to those really high numbers is that there's been a, there's been a, a commitment across the federal government for some time and then we you know, stepped on the brake, um, I'm sorry, on the gas rather hard to put more money into it. But with, uh, with, as a result, we're still evolving in our sophistication of response at the state level. Um, some ISPs are telling us, um, you know, the states are engaging um, in a very sophisticated way, and others are telling us, 
well, you know, we're reporting cases of overbuilding or, dupl du or duplicative building or of um, funding through multiple programs for a single build, and the states are having a hard time responding to it because their broadband offices aren't sufficiently developed in some cases. So it's my hope that, um, that states continue to develop their capacities in this area, that uh, the NTIA, um, I, I can't say I envy them the, the, the huge job of, of implementing a program of this scale. You know, obviously they have to do a lot of hiring to do it. It's going to require a transformative work at the agency. I've got no doubt that they're up to a, the job, but it's a big job, right? And then it's going to require continued proactive engagement from the FCC with all those other stakeholders to make sure that the, that the end result is acceptable to the American public and was a good use of public money. Okay, now we've heard talk about there being significant resources being uh, devoted to uh, reaching unserved Americans and, and connecting uh, all of America. Um, and, and we've heard concerns about fraud, waste, and abuse and lack of coordination. So that could mean there could be potential for significant fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, are there any action items or steps that could be taken now to make sure it doesn't happen as opposed to just simply having, you know, Inspector General GAO reports after it's all done saying, yeah, we lost a lot of money, uh, you know, looking in hindsight? Well, uh, Absolutely. So uh, the, the, there's there's a lot that could be done. Um, there's a lot that could, well, you know. I don't want to write off after the fact enforcement too much. You know, I th yeah. I th it's 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 important to close that. It's important to close those loops. It's important to make sure that whatever we may determine at the FCC is is promptly implemented by the DOJ. And if if Congress isn't you know isn't happy with DOJ prioritization, then to address the question of separate enforcement powers um, at the agency levels. But you know, putting that to one side. Uh, putting that to one side, uh, I think our sophistication in data management is is continuing to improve. Um, just you know, to, to pick an example, uh, because it's work that I'm proud of at the commission currently, uh, we. Uh, we've recently reformed the way that people apply for E-rate funds. So that item a couple months ago um, now keeps a lot of the, uh, of the record maintenance and filing directly at the commission. So instead of auditing it, we control the information from the application stage through the uh, delivery and uh, post-delivery audit stage. So it's the beginning of uh, expanded oversight capacity within the federal government overspend like this. Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that that alone is probably not going to satisfy <laughs> uh, potential concerns about waste, fraud, and abuse. But it's a sign of uh, it's a sign of the the type of approach that we'll need to take down the road in order to make sure that we have a greater understanding of the process. But again, I want to emphasize the the uh, cycle of engagement between between FCC, NTIA, and state governments that's going to be necessary for us to continue gathering the information that we need for effective oversight of this diversity of programs. All right, so there are a lot of things, I, I think, that need to be in that uh, particular um, oversight gumbo. <laughs> um, you know, data collection um, is key. The sharing of intelligence uh, will uh, make it easier um, to reduce, uh, you know, intentional uh, fraud um, and abuse. Using and incorporating analytical uh, tools will help mitigate um, you know, the, the type of uh, risk and hold wrongdoers uh, accountable. Identifying and excluding companies that have applied for multiple, um, you know, loans or have applications under the same name or, or have you, are using that same IP address. Um, you know, checking their banking history. There are a number of things that uniformly, um, you know, a, a, a working template needs to be uh, ubiquitous, needs to be across the board um, in order to take place. Look, we want this money to go further. Uh, to serve more, uh, we want to save. It would be lovely if we could return. If if, if the uh, commissioner is right about, uh, uh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, too much. You know, lovely to do other, you know, things uh, with it that we will need. Um, but at the end of the day, from the beginning, as we are getting firmer grounding, um, you know, from all of these agencies, uh, in, including the FCC, all of those things need to be the place. It needs to be front of mind. Everyone wants this to work. Uh, we do not want people getting enriched uh, wrongly, uh, you know, from this, um, and it's going to have to take that coordination. It's not going to be organic. Um, that's you, you might have gotten a 50% feedback because it's not organic. We've been siloed for a long time. It is very difficult to break that, but we must, when it comes to this, we must make this an, as an example because if we get this right, um, you know, I, I think the best is yet to come in terms of other things and other priorities we have in this nation. This could be an incredible template uh, for uh, others to follow. Yeah, I think we got to stay vigilant. I mean, there's an old saying in 
in Washington, I think I, I don't have it exactly right, but when Congress spends significant sums on infrastructure spending, two things are going to happen. Infrastructure is going to get built, and people are going to go to jail. And I think we're going to see that <laughs> take place in this program, and so we've got to stay pretty vigilant about that. All right, so if we are successful with the program and, and the others and reaching unserved, I want to talk about the future of the Universal Service Fund and what's that going to be like. Do you see, uh, Commissioner Symington, any kind of uh, a change for the Universal Service Fund, or do you see its role shifting or, or anything like that? I'd be interested in your views about the future of USF. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't think anyone looking at the world of 2022 would have designed the USF funding mechanism um, given, uh, given the, the current sources of funding and, uh, and the majority of current spend, right? I mean, using telephony to, to fund broadband spend probably made a great deal of sense at the time, and then things have evolved, and you know, no wonder, it's, you know, it's been a while. Um, but, but you can see the path dependency of it, and, um, and of course, this, this raises questions as to alternatives. Um, one alternative that's, uh, that's, you know, that's one possibility is simply to say, well, okay, use broadband to fund broadband and to apply, um, and to apply uh, the USF contribution factor to uh, bias providers. Um, another, <coughs> another approach that's been mooted by people on both sides of the, of the political aisle is to go upstream a little bit and to ask who's the ultimate beneficiary at the business level of connectivity. Um, I, would have, I would have argued that during monopoly era AT&T, the value was in owning the network, not in having the individual last mile connection, right? And in fact, AT&T in the monopoly era was perfectly willing to lose money on last mile connections on an individual basis in order to maintain control over the network as a whole and to make themselves the, the only source, and which I think is, is something the US government was also comfortable with. Um, but nonetheless, every time a broadband provider adds a customer, you have to ask who else adds a customer. Search engines add, a cust add customers, right? Streaming video adds, adds customers. Um, online web apps add customers. And it, it, may be the, it may be the case that, in fact, if a, com a company has sufficient market penetration, there's much more upside ultimately to that company, especially, again, given that it, very often its cost structure is almost pure profit per incremental user. There might be much more upside for that company um, than for the actual last mile provider to add, an, add a customer at the last mile. So if this theory is, holds water, then the question would be why are we charging the last mile, who is not the greatest beneficiary of adding the last mile customer, um, and not charging the upstream companies that are the primary beneficiaries. Now, this I think would require us to sort of to, to think through this question of, of who's the beneficiary of, of network effects. But on the other hand, I would say that the business models of many companies, whether that's those are equipment companies or SaaS companies or uh, social media companies or video companies, is predicated on the assumption of universal broadband or near to universal broadband. And without that, they wouldn't have a customer base. And so you know, from a certain point of view, this is not unlike uh, broadcasters being allocated free spectrum back in the day, although I think the broadcasters are pretty much all paid for their spectrum at this point. But, but it's not unlike that in that the federal government has built out infrastructure that has immense upside to private companies that in this case are uh, structurally non-contributors to USF. So I, th those are two reform approaches that I think um, we're likely to see explored because the pressure on telephony is, is getting unbearable. And you know, what I'm hearing from business telephony users, users, for example, is that they can't even budget effectively because they have no idea what the contribution factor is going to be from quarter to quarter. So All right. So Commissioner Carr, the FCC is exploring these things. They have a proceeding ongoing right now uh, about the future of universal service. It's going yeah. to be uh, submitting a report to Congress. Um, we just heard some, a, a lot of ideas from Commissioner Symington. There's been a lot of discussion out there generally about uh, contributions and how to, how to fund universal service going forward. Um, could you give us where you stand on that right now? Or what kind yep. of reforms do you have in mind? And, and what are the best ways to fund it? I mean, your surcharges, do we have continue? Do we expand? <coughs> do we um, have annual appropriations by Congress? I'd be interested in your take. Yeah. Well, to start, unlike I think everyone in this room, uh, I did not make the Washingtonians uh, top 500 most influential people in Washington. I'm pretty confident had they extended it to 501, I would have made the cut. I think I was right <laughs> on the door just knocking uh, and didn't make it. But notwithstanding that, I do have a view uh, on this issue, which is to say really it reflects a lot of where uh, my colleague, Mr. Symington, is on that issue. I mean, right now, uh, Telephony revenues, the revenue base that we use for universal services is, you know, somewhere in the 30 to $40 billion range. It's a significant decline from where it was when we initiated uh, this mechanism. And Universal Service Fund um, supports 
all sorts of really valuable programs from infrastructure builds in rural America to telehealth programs to low income programs. And some people have sort of said, well, look, we've got this big slug of infrastructure dollars. Doesn't that take the pressure off? And the universal service contribution factor went from 30% down to you know, something like 22 or 23. Well, first of all, that, that number is going to come flying back towards 30% uh, very quickly here. Two, you know, a lot of the dollars coming out right now are CapEx, not OpEx. We need continuing support. Plus, our low-income programs are going to need continuing to support. So we have to make sure, in my view, that the universal service fund is sustainable. And I do think we need to start looking to big tech to start contributing a fair share. And one idea that I think that's out there is looking at um, digital advertising revenues. You know, right now, that's something like $180 billion a year industry and growing. And you compare that again to the 30 or 40 billion telephony. And I do think that they are one of the largest beneficiaries of this spending. And right now, it's a direct pass-through to consumers' traditional telephone bills. And if you look to large tech companies, and digital advertising revenues in particular, there's a lot of you know, room between those revenues that the company has and any end user bill, such that net-net is going to reduce the impact um, on consumers. So I think that we, we, we definitely should be doing that. There's some people that are advocating that we should just go 100% and take it from the telephone portion of your bill to the internet portion of your bill. And I think that's a mistake. I, I think we absolutely need to build a firewall around the idea that 100% of this should be coming out of uh, the pockets of consumers on their broadband bills. Should some portion of it go in? Do broadband providers benefit from it? Yeah, I'm, I'm open to some idea along those lines as a compromise, but my starting position is we cannot, it's a non-starter to say that this should go 100% onto the internet bill. Affordability is so important right now, you know, driving up artificially the bills of um, uh, internet bills for consumers should be something that um, I think that we all reject. Do you believe, Commissioner Carr, that the FCC has authority right now to expand the contribution base in some way to certain online providers of some kind or other that offer services like voice or other, or other things like that? Yes and no. There's, there are some okay. um, revenue streams of large technology companies that I think would be accessible under the current structure, things that look like, you know, cloud-based transport, you know, maybe the voice component of uh, Microsoft Xbox, but it's like, it's a small portion of what I think we need to do. So I think, yes, we could start, but the reality is we need additional authority from Congress to sweep in what I think are sort of the, the full suite of, of large technology company revenues. And that's why I'm, I'm pleased that Congress is starting to look at this. There's some bipartisan support. There's some study bills that are out there. Uh, and I think the FCC could you know, go ahead and issue an NPRM that looks at a lot of these issues while we you know, hopefully wait to get some additional authority uh, from Congress. Okay, so Commissioner Symington, in the notice of inquiry that the FCC put out about the future of universal service, it asks about the structural arrangement of the universal service and having the universal service administrative company administer it. And there, there's even a lawsuit in the Fifth Circuit that raised similar points of questions about delegating authority to a private uh, company for this. You know, without expecting you to weigh in necessarily on litigation, I mean, do you have any just policy preferences about structure of the FCC or, or perhaps change going forward? Well, as, as, far as, uh, as far as any questions about where, for example, the Supreme Court may see the future of administrative law going, um, I'm, I'm going to say that that, that, is best left to, uh, that is best left to the FCC's own litigators. Um, not, not necessarily sure I'd want to take a position on that. Um, Although it, you know, it, it is certainly possible to imagine that, uh, that with some signals that we've seen from the Supreme Court, administrative law may go in a different direction down the road. And if it does, then we'll just have to adapt at the FCC. Net neutrality could be the test case. We'll see. It, it really could. It, it, it depends what sort of item we wind up getting. Um, as far as, uh, you know, as, as far as structure of universal service, you know, authority and so forth, well, you know, to, to, to sort of tack on to what Commissioner Carr just said, um, back in 2006, we brought in VoIP, right, uh, through uh, 249D, I want to say, um, that, which is the general power to, um, to draw on providers of interstate communications for contributions. And I think, you know, that's how we get Xbox Live uh, as a contributor to USF. That would be the theory. Um, as, far as, as far as something beyond that, I guess I would, I would go with, uh, with Commissioner Carr's statement that if Congress decides to adopt the theory that, um, that companies with large network effects that are dependent on universal service should be contributors to USF, that would go beyond the, the, the theory that we drew on for VoIP. And um, I don't know that that would be something we could do under our own authority. 
uh, that might be a little ambitious, and that might uh, that might invite the sort of of uh, the sort of pushback that we uh, might not consider prudent. All right, now, Commissioner Kleinbert, I wanted to ask you a couple of things uh, on these topics as well. Do, do you have a view about expanding the contribution base in terms of online services and things like that? I'd be interested in uh, your perspective. I do, um, but I'll just say this: um, I think that the mechanism uh, uh, that we um, that is devised needs to be equitable. It needs to be equitable. Um, yes, I, I absolutely do have a strong uh, view. It, uh, I may or may not, uh, may, maybe that'll be, maybe you'll invite me back. Um, uh, because <laughs> I, I say that um, because of history as a guide, I came into, uh, uh, well, into regulation, state regulation. This was an issue. I left <laughs> regulation. This is an issue. So um, uh, on part B, I'll tell you, um, you know, how I, I really feel. But uh, going back a, a little bit right quickly um, with that uh, future of, uh, uh, the, of Internet uh, service uh, proceeding, uh, what's happening now is definitely going to impact. How long that is, uh, you know, we don't, don't know. But the FCC rightly is and should take a deep dive analysis of all of this. Um, we, we should not be afraid of the answers. Uh, and I really think um, that it will uh, uh, enable the agency to further reform, to, to better define, and to modernize you know, continually, which it should always do. Uh, and, and so uh, I, 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 this moment, though painful in a lot of ways, it really is enabling us you know, to look in that regulatory mirror um, and uh, make, uh, make adjustments um, you know, where needed. And I think that's important. I think ultimately that's healthy and best um, for us all in terms of efficiencies and really moving things um, you know, quickly. Okay, and, and, and if, if we're successful with the significant spending uh, on deployment and adoption programs, I mean, could, could you foresee a universal service where the high cost fund looks a lot different or perhaps less need for, for as much now or might the landscape should shift if, if we suddenly have a lot more areas being, being served? I am, I'm hoping, I mean, you know, for shifts, I, um, if we build future proof networks, then, then I, I will say, you know, yes. You know, all of those things, those, those details are very important. Um, if we do things respectfully to those um, who are accustomed to doing things the same way, uh, the companies that are accustomed um, to getting um, the majority of the pie, if we continue on th this course, then this will be, you know, uh, we will be in this uh, perpetual vortex that I don't think is healthy for, uh, you know, for any of us, to be honest with you, in terms of growth. So, um, you know, I, I just believe that we need to continue, we need to continually adjust our lenses um, and, uh, and, and take advantage of this moment when we can do so, you know, with more freedom and, uh, you know, and we can do so more abundantly. Um, and I think at the end of the day, even with the painful hiccups and, you know, people not um, responding to Commissioner Carl, which I do all, you know, or not do all the time. Um, no, seriously, I do respond. How I respond is a different way. Um, but, you know, I, I think, honestly, these are, you know, times for us to do uh, to do good by way of the American public and to do better by way of managing um, these agencies. Okay, now Commissioner Carr, going forward, we won't have repeated opportunities to spend $800 billion on broadband. Um, good thing, yeah. So are there, are there non-spending ways that we can continue to expand deployment or, or reduce regulatory obstacles or at the local level? Do, do you see more? Uh, out there that, that could be accomplished? Yeah, look, I had the, the good fortune of uh, running the FC's wireless infrastructure reforms under Chairman Pai, and you know, it really helped to accelerate internet bills. We went from something like 708 new cell sites in this country uh, in 2016 to post-reform, something like 46,000 cell sites. So regulatory reform makes sense, and there's still some low-hanging fruit there. One, you know, I think we should take a lot of the reforms that we did on the wireless side, looking at 332 and 253, and apply those to the fixed or wireline side, meaning look at you know shot clocks, look at uh, cost-based reforms. I think if we can uh, apply the lessons learned on the wireless infrastructure side to the wired, I think that'd be a good thing. I think you know, we have a lot of challenges still crossing federal lands. I know we've tried to crack that nut a number of times. It's a challenge. 
small things, railroad crossings continue to be an unbelievable burden on deploying uh, internet infrastructure. There could be some reforms there. On the federal land side, I've talked about you know, a federal lands desk at the FCC to try to accelerate um, those types of efforts. Uh, and in the House, uh, Kathy Morse-Rogers, Republican leader on commerce, has a package with her uh, colleagues of 28 infrastructure reforms that would, I think, go a long way to uh, accelerating infrastructure. So yeah, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit left on, on infrastructure that we should be doing. Polls as well, 224 could use an update. It doesn't apply to certain municipal and co-op own polls. I think that would be a good reform as well. So there's you know four or five things we could get done. Okay, uh, Commissioner Symington, uh, we just had the issue of uh, poll attachments come up and uh, municipalities and electricity co-ops are exempted from the, uh, the rate regulation system that we have for um, avoiding monopoly rents for polls. Uh, do you believe that Congress should remove that exemption? Um, you know, before, before I get into that specific question, I just, just want to point out um, that the, the, the length of process that we are typically dealing with in poll situations is, um, is itself an issue. So the, in part, of, part of the quest for perfect justice on polls has, has often meant that, meant that things get tied up for a long time and we don't get infrastructure deployed. So, um, so I would like, uh, in a, in, you know, it, I, I'm not gonna get too law school on, a, on anyone here, but we've all, you know, we've all seen the situation of the Kosian negotiation once it's, once it's clear how the rights are allocated. So greater clarity in allocating the rights is generally a good, uh, generally a good idea and lack of clarity in that area is generally things that, is something that holds things up. So, um, so I, I don't think it would be a bad thing at all if Congress were to take up uh, 224 again and, um, and address the question of getting to a more uniform, predictable framework for polls. Um, of course, you know, we, don't, we don't want to take it away from states that certified, but we do want there to be a uniform, uh, a uniform predictable framework uh, that anyone engaging in a build on either side uh, can, where, where they can be reasonably see, uh, certain about what their rights and cost structure will look like. And I, I think, think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, please, please, please go ahead, Commissioner Coburn. No. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I just think that um, places that, that are doing it right should be amplified. Um, I, I agree that uniformity, and it's one of the things I talked about, it, you know, I, I, I took the more sugar approach, I won't say the other S, mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, when we talk about <laughs> these deficiencies, that, um, that exist at the local level and the pressure that will continue uh, to build um, because of the, uh, the infusion of, you know, of capital, of capital um, in these um, states and, and, and local communities. You know, the, permits, the permit requests are coming and they're gonna be uh, you know, amplified by the nth degree. So how do communities um, that might be under-resourced um, uh, in, a, in a number of ways, usually by, in terms of personnel and expertise, you know, how can we, um, you know, build and help them climb? Um, I, I just think that approach, uh, the in the meantime approach, approach um, may negate the need for, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, you know, more, um, you know, aggressive. And I, I think that allows for more creativity, uh, you know, um, a, a more, uh, uh, really expanding and, and, and increasing the thought when we talk about P3s. Um, but a lot of it's going to come from um, our, our regulatory um, home bases. And what I mean by that, the training and the, um, the good ideas and the guidance, um, I think has to be um, top down to that these partnerships, the state and federal partnerships need to be th uh, strengthened. We don't agree on many things but we should agree that we want um, you know, these communities to be connected and it is a dual, minimally um, a, a dual, um, uh, it, it will take dual approaches um, and, and a federal and state, uh, you know, a better alignment in order for that to happen. So uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that all of these incentives, because the incentives are there, um, we just need to, every agency uh, needs to, uh, at least, I think once a week, uh, pull back or, or, or discard whatever has been its regulatory norm. And if we can say one little thing a week, you know, coming off that, the, by, 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 the, by the end of six months, uh, we might have, a, you know, a workable uh, solution, so we're cooking with grease. Um, you know, I was gonna, I, I didn't eat breakfast, so anything that um, promotes um, 
uh, cooking and eating. Um, I was going to make a reference before I sat down. All right. Well, uh, one last uh, uh, non-spending infrastructure question right now, and that, uh, Commissioner Carr, from time to time, uh, the issue pops up of twilight towers, that there are these towers around, the regulatory status is uncertain. Uh, very, very, very important. I haven't heard that word in, in years, so yeah. Okay. It comes up and it goes Let's away. And I, I, is that issue stuck in the twilight again? I mean, <laughs> I, is, is, is there any chance that um, this could be a source of getting good infrastructure out there, getting it upgraded? Well, from the FCC's perspective, you know, we reached a final decision, a bipartisan decision actually, uh, and solved it, and it, it moved on to another independent agency, and it, it didn't get uh, across the finish line there. But the reality is, again, when you engage in the infrastructure reforms that we did, and had you know those 46,000 new towers in 2019 alone get out there, uh, I think that largely uh, overtook that issue. But stepping back, you know, one issue that, that's sort of important to me right now is, you know, is, is sort of spectrum reform more generally. And we've seen sort of this um, challenge over the last couple of years of other uh, agencies attempting to, you know, irrigate to itself power to regulate in the spectrum context um, that Congress didn't give it. And, you know, we, we've seen it increasingly in the C-band with FAA and DOT. I mean, look, I came to the FCC in 2012 uh, because I wanted to go work for the nation's, you know, spectrum regulator. And now as a commissioner, I really like, you know, participating in the establishment of the regulatory framework uh, for wireless. And little did I know that I should have been applying to the Department of Transportation, <laughs> that they're the nation's premier uh, <laughs> spectrum regulator, at least when it comes to C-band. But for my part, you know, I'm not just going to sit back while DOT tries to eat our lunch. And this isn't, like, new with DOT. It's not new with the Biden administration. We Clearly, we saw this during the Trump administration as well. We saw it with DOT back then. We saw it with NOAA with um, uh, uh, 24 gigahertz band. We see it across the board. We see it with DOD, obviously, with Legato and other instances. And at the end of the day, Congress made a decision. They said the FAA, F FAA, the FCC, oh. uh, oh. a couple <laughs> letters there. I know, it's, it's hard. It's hard, this new, this new world we're in. You know, the, the FCC is the nation's uh, spectrum regulator. You can feed your views into it, get your studies into it. The FCC is going to listen to all stakeholders, and we're going to make the decision that's in the public interest. And so I saw, you know, recently the DOT made some more comments about not knowing that everything is going to be completely copacetic by uh, this next deadline we have for the C-band. Uh, and, and, and from my view, you know, that's unacceptable. If there's any changes that should be made with respect to the regulatory framework of the FCC licensees, with respect to their build-out pursuant to the FCC's regime, it should be made by the FCC. All right, now, Commissioner Clyburn, regarding spectrum thanks authority. For asking about that. Thanks for asking about and, that. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, you, you did my segue for me. So, you know, I had it right here. Spectrum was on the thing, so I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn, uh, in terms of spectrum coordination between agencies, uh, that, that Congress has uh, seemed to, uh, members of Congress, to introduce the Improving Spectrum Coordination Act that would update the memorandum of understanding between FCC and NTIA. I mean, do you think that that could actually help reduce these kinds of, of things, or, or, or do you see any other kind of meaningful steps? It, it, is process going to do it? Um, could it go some way with some kind of formalized rules? Um, we've seen to, to avoid these kinds of situations of, um, you know, whether it's the L band or the C band or, or these other bands being held up. I, uh, you probably get from um, uh, my posture that I am one that embraces MOUs, um, that it embraces, uh, you know, coordination. Uh, you, you know, heck, we all, you know, you all work for the government, <laughs> and it should work more harmoniously. And, um, you know, there are shades of gray when it comes to commercial and government, you know, spectrum, you know, I, I, honestly. So, you know, we need to a acknowledge that and, um, and continue to uh, build and improve relationships. And yes, I, I guess the short answer um, is yes. Um, uh, double the number of MOUs, I don't know what all they were saying, but just double them and, and, and abide by them. I, I just don't see um, if all of us truly believe, um, you know, what we're offering, what we're selling, what we're telling the American people, I don't see how we, um, you know, can punt that anymore. So let bygones be bygones. Um, chances are great, you know, uh, chances are not even a chance. There's a new administrator. <laughs> so, and I'm not saying anything. I like the past administration. Um, you know, but um, this is a new day. We need to all reset. Um, and and, and the, the, again, the short answer, I can't give short answers because it's not my nature. Um, you know, the, yes, it's a must. 
We've got no other choice. All right, so another approach, perhaps, at um, addressing these spectrum fights, really, among agencies even, uh, I, I wonder might come about in the area of radio signal interference immunity and, and the, the work that the commission has just started at the behest of, of you, Commissioner Symington. In fact, it was at a Free State Foundation 15th anniversary conference in October that you brought this subject to public attention. Um, so I, I want to get your take. Um, what, what, what do you hope to see out of this uh, proceeding that the uh, FCC has commenced uh, looking at um, device uh, receiver interference? Well, <clears throat> well, Seth, I'm always happy to talk about this issue, particularly at Free State. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this, this is one of this is one of uh, this is one of the best ideas that I've ever had, and I can say that because it's actually <laughs> what I did is I took the TAC reports from 2013 oh. to 2016 and filed off the serial numbers more or less, and then you know, and then again, get them back in the record. Um, in, in all seriousness, there's, there's been a significant scientific and engineering effort for some time to determine how to resolve some of the problems with, um, with entrenched poor quality receivers. And uh, poor quality receivers is always a little bit of a judgment call because you know, how do you balance it against price? How do you balance it against performance? How do you balance it against other criteria? But there's no doubt that there are a lot of services out there where the receivers have not kept pace in terms of spectral efficiency with what you see in sectors where that's more prioritized, like wireless mobility. What I'd like to see come out of the proceeding is an attempt to address this question without getting too programmatic and telling receiver manufacturers how to do their jobs. I don't think people necessarily appreciate the difficulty of a receiver regulation regime that would be comparable to the transmission regulation regime that we have right now. Because with, re with uh, receivers, uh, you, you, can't, you can't test them meaningfully in a lab. You have to test them in a field. And to a degree, what you're testing in the field is not even the receiver itself, but the environment and the interaction of the receiver with the overall interference and geographical environment at that, at that point in time, you know, with that particular level of solar radiation, et cetera, it, it gets very complicated very fast. So what I'm hoping to come out of this proceeding is something of a rights regime where it's, uh, where it's, uh, it's possible to say that um, in order to operate at a, at a particular service, you have to accept a certain level of interference before you can raise a harmful interference claim, effectively creating a safe harbor uh, for conforming transmitters. And by doing that, we, uh, my, we look at a number of approaches. I'm not going to make any secret that my favorite is the one that I've just outlined, the harm claim threshold approach. But by, by getting to some sort of a regime like that, my hope is that um, is twofold. First of all, that we highlight areas where there are still um, where there are still possibilities for great spectral gains because of increasing receiver uh, efficiency, and thus asking the question of to what degree continued uh, receiver inefficiency and the large bands that are required to support it, and large guard bands that are required to support it. Do, asking the question to what degree that's still in the public interest. That's, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is by getting to a high degree of certainty, or at least a much higher degree of certainty that we have right now that you're operating within a safe harbor, hopefully um, uh, entities planning to increase service and engage in further build outs will have a greater degree of security and not feel that, uh, that at any point they could be, um, they could be subject to, uh, to criticism despite operating within the terms of their license. Oh, okay, so I, I want to try and, and break this down a little bit sure. simpler because I approached this issue in reading the notice of you know notice of inquiry the FCC put out, and uh, it was a little bit drinking from a fire hose. I had to read it over slowly a bunch of times, and, and so maybe I can test my understanding on you. So we've got all kinds of radio devices out there. They receive signals. Uh, sometimes um, emissions from one spectrum band can you know, bleed over to another uh, band and. Maybe it might be the receiver's really old. It wasn't even designed for the modern era. And um, the idea is we can't always hold up new spectrum allocations and new services because there's some old junky receivers in certain bands far away from the new services we want. And so might this uh, proceeding be able to create a set of public expectations about how seriously we should take the complaints of the owners of these old receivers uh, when their services seem to go a little haywire because of a new service in a near, near band. Does that, does that seem to make 
Yeah, you know, and, and Seth, you're not alone. I had to read okay. the NOI several times okay. slowly myself. <laughs> um, so it's 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 a complex topic, and it it's an area of, of uh, it's an area that that's always been sort of out of bounds at the commission because we've always known that it was that it's very hard to meaningfully test receiver performance or to say a priori uh, how good a receiver has to be. Um, I guess I'd, I'd put it, I'd, I'd use a real estate analogy. Um, it, let's, let's say for example that, uh, let's say for example that you've got uh, certain expectations <laughs> for air and light in, in this private house that you have next door to a skyscraper. Or let's say, for, let's say right now it's a private house next door to a private house. But it's in New York, so at some point one of the brownstones is going to go down. Maybe a bunch of brownstones are going to go down, and a big tower is going to go up. That's how you get more people on Manhattan Island, right? So now, in, if it's if if it's your private brownstone and they're putting up a big building next to it, then you're immediately going to go to court and say, "Hey, I've got an air and light easement. You know, I've I've got a reasonable expectation that I'm not going to you know be." a little five-story building surrounded by 40-story buildings um, feeling like I'm living at the bottom of a well. We don't recognize this concept of an air and light easement in spectrum policy. It may be that a, that a service is operated for a long time in the expectation that the bands around it are going to be quiet forever, and as such, the receivers that are market practice in that, uh, for that service uh, are, for example, not, uh, not well filtered or not attempting to do a high degree of out-of-band re uh, uh, rejection because it was just never a uh, concern before. Just as, you know, just as you always had enough air and light in your house so you didn't worry about, you know, being, about uh, being built up around you. The difficulty is, at this point, there's no greenfield left. Um, we're, at, at this point, with, with Americans' uh, demand for continuing, uh, you know, for, uh, for continuing improvement in service, our expectations of continuing improvement, just you know, to pick one example, uh, wireless data uh, consumption on a per capita basis has gone up by a factor of my back of the envelope calculation suggest about 140 times. That's not 140%, that's 140 times um, in the past 10 years. So, Freeing up spectrum for this use and for the IoT uses that are going to ride on top of 5G networks and perhaps eventually um, even be larger than uh, than consumer commercial uses, you know, there's there's going to need to be a lot freed up for that. Likewise, there's going to be uh, there's going to need to be things freed up for uh, relatively high powered unlicensed uses, um, and we can't do that while continuing to give blanket respect to receivers that were designed in another era. I'm not sure I would describe those receivers as being junky so much as adapted for an interference environment that is increasingly irrelevant as we continue build out. And do we want a way to, to say to people, you should fix your receivers? That, that's hard to say at a regulatory level. It would, in a certain sense, require the FCC to become the R&D shop for the industry. I don't think anyone wants us to do it. I don't know that we could do it without completely changing the face of the agency, going on a hiring binge, um, it, it, and we'd be out of step with international norms. So there are a lot of reasons not to take that approach. I think instead the approach that we take is simply to have a heightened way of putting people on notice that we are, in fact, not going to terminate skyscraper construction. I think another, uh, another, another al analogy is, uh, is to, to kids. So I've got three kids, and, I, and I, I see this all the time. So I have one kid that will walk past another kid, and just the, the turbulent air of walking close by to the other kid will impact uh, the kid, and the kid impacted by the turbulent air walking, going past him, will fall on the ground, and will grab their arm, claim that it's been broken, act like they've been hit by a sledgehammer, and as the parent, you step in and say, get up off the ground, you're, you're fine, you know, nothing happened to them. And, and that's kind of the way a lot of this, this sort of receiver standard type of debate has, has come on. People come in and say, look, I'm you know, completely blown out of the water, by you know, 1 dB of energy located hundreds of megahertz away, and we say, get, you know, get up off the ground, you're fine, it's not gonna cause you any trouble. And I'm hoping that this becomes a diminishing problem in two respects. One, I'm hopeful we make progress on the ideas that Commissioner Symington has put out there, and we have some you know, basic rules of the road out there if, if, if that's where we end up needing to go. And two, I think people should hopefully be on a lot more notice going forward that you can't be putting in you know, glass-jawed receivers uh, or bad receivers and then coming to us 10 years down the road and A, first of all, not being upfront with us. You can't come to us and say, hey, you know, our really good receivers are getting blown out of the water by you know, this one dB of energy located you know, miles away. If you've got a bad receiver, come to us, you know, tell us up front, and we can, we can deal with that. Um, but these arguments that people are getting blown out of the way by you know, small amounts of energy just doesn't make sense. 
uh, and the extent that you know it's true in some bands, and hopefully people are on notice now going forward, you can't be putting those in there because we've got to do a lot more with a lot less when it comes to spectrum. All right, thank you, Commissioner Carr. I appreciate your illustration. I can relate a little bit having four <laughs> young children at my yeah. house. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn, I want to go on to a topic slightly less ridiculously complex, and that would be uh, spectrum auctions. And uh, the FCC is teeing up a spectrum in the 2.5 gigahertz band for auction. Uh, do you have any viewpoints about what needs to be done or not be done to make that successful? Yes. Do you care to share with us <laughs> your wisdom? So um, I, it is I, not a stretch for me if you're asking um, how the bidding format should be. All of the above. Um, I would uh, favor the a simultaneous multiple round bidding format. Okay. Um, Commissioner Symington, um, we, the FCC uh, auctioned 100 megahertz in the 3.45 to 3.55 gigahertz band. We're looking now lower uh, three gigahertz. Is that something where, where Congress is going to need to give you authorization to, to take the next step to move further down? And what kind of timeline do you think before we could get that moving? Or, or what, what could the FCC do to get that uh, more spectrum in the lower three gigahertz band auctioned? Right. Well, so, so this, this, is, this is a question um, that ties in part to the question of reauthorization authority. I mean, there, there obviously we want to get reauthorized, but uh, there's, there's also sort of the question, do we want to make a longer term reauthorization contingent on some sort of spectrum planning um, and, and some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, uh, guide from Congress as to which bands should be commercialized um, and, and whether that would touch the lower three. Um, I, I th it's, it's always helpful to have a mandate from Congress. Um, I don't think we need an explicit mandate to start looking at the lower three or to, uh, you know, I don't, maybe start looking is the wrong word because I, I think, you know, that those conversations have been happening within the building. But, um, but a mandate from Congress would definitely be one way to, um, to resolve some of these problems. The pro I would be worried, however, in putting too much reliance on just the mandate from Congress. And let, let me tell you why. A mandate, from, a mandate from Congress can give an executive agency an obligation to respond, but it can't necessarily clear the technical obligations that would, um, uh, that would make that agency feel like it has equities that must be defended. So for example, mil uh, military radars are gonna be a major thing in lower three. And those are, you know, those are radars that have uh, very significant reliance interests on them. So the question of spectrum clearance would, there would need much more than just a mandate. It would need technical understanding, and it would need goodwill on the parts of, you know, of Congress, the FCC, and then obviously the federal agencies. Um, would, it, would it be helpful to have a mandate from Congress? You know, that, that's always nice. You can always point to Congress and say, you know, they told us to do this, we're gonna go do it. And at the FCC, we love carrying out the will of Congress. That's probably why our oversight hearings went so well this, this last little, little while, right? So um, we, we love carrying out the will of Congress. It's great to have that at our backs, but it's not enough. We also, beyond that, need to have uh, a framework for dispute resolution that has buy-in from everyone at the agency level. And I think that's how we get it to not just happen, but to happen timely. Because the real value to lower three would be, would be unlocking it timely, not unlocking it in 10 years. In 10 years, it may not be a relevant band. All right, I'm going to ask one or maybe two more questions, but I want to have some time for questions from members of the audience, so if you want to try and uh, think of those. Um, in times past, we've had a, a microphone go around. Uh, perhaps it will reappear and uh, help, help project the voice for the questions. Um, but I want to um, uh, flash forward a bit, Commissioner Clyburn. I see talk sometimes about something called 6G. Uh, we're still very much in the midst of 5G, but this spectrum takes a long time to plan. It takes a long time to get out there. Do you see any, any is the time to act now to get that going? What, what do you see as being a priority there? So I agree with the uh, chairwoman. Um, I, we are already laying out plans um, you know, in, in the US, but um, uh, I believe she forecast at the uh, Mobile World Congress uh, that um, it's time to get ready. Look, you've got to look at what's happening in the rest of the world. You've got six Genesis, um, you know, in Finland. They're working on um, 6G. 
uh, technology uh, research. You've got uh, the Ministry of Industry and uh, Information uh, you know, Technology um, you know, entity in China investing and monitoring the development um, uh, process of a 6G network. And in South Korea, you've got the Electronics and Communications Research and Institute um, you know, that is researching terahertz uh, you know, band technology. So um, we cannot um, uh, afford to, um, we've, we've got to walk and chew gum um, while we, you know, as we continue to make 5G more ubiquitous, we've got to plan at the same time, uh, you know, the mechanisms um, to ensure that uh, um, 6G has the oxygen that thrive um, because the rest of the world, um, you know, is, is moving, movers and shakers in the rest of the world. Um, you know, they're moving and, um, you know, uh, we have to uh, maintain um, our edge and um, the, the standards in order to move with them, uh, show a little bias, hopefully ahead of them. Uh, you know, Commissioner Carr, I'm going to extend you the courtesy of giving you a fill-in-the-blank question so that you can uh, be asked by me any question that you want that I didn't ask you. Mm. Uh, well, so. thanks for that question about Elon <laughs> Musk and China and Twitter and all these other issues. Uh, you know, look, I, think, I do think national security is, is really important. You know, I've tried to, to, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to secure our networks from the threats posed by insecure gear. Uh, there's a Secure Equipment Act that Congress passed that the FCC needs to get across the finish line in terms of taking our covered list, which right now is a, a list that basically prohibits you from getting USF subsidies, to a list um, that prohibits you from getting equipment authorization. I think that's going to be a very important step to make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, it's the insecure gear that's the challenge, not, you know, the funding source for that insecure gear. So I do think we need to get across the finish line. Um, I do think, you know, look, I've spoken a lot, Free State has spoken a lot, Randy May, uh, about sort of reining in big tech more generally in Section 230 reform. I think that's, you know, table stakes. I think Section 230 reform is, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. I'm, I'm very glad to hear uh, that Elon Musk is purchasing Twitter, and I hope that he follows through on sort of his pro-speech reforms that he's talked about. But I personally don't think we need to trust in the, the hopeful benevolence of, of any particular billionaire when it comes to something so important as the digital town square. And that's why I think we still need 230 reform. We need accountability, we need transparency. I think we need some core non-discrimination obligations as well, and I think we use user empowerment. At the end of the day, you know, when it comes to the free speech debate in this country, I really think Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter has just revealed um, this underlying free speech divide in the country. One of these people don't understand is, you know, on Twitter, if you don't want to hear something, you don't have to follow it. You can block, I don't, I don't block people, but you can block, I, this isn't you know, bird box at the end of the day, no one's holding your eyes open and forcing you uh, to, to observe speech that you don't want to see. So what people mean is, when they don't want this on Twitter, they, mean they don't want it to exist anywhere. And I think that, that's a problem. I think it re reflects um, a real cultural problem in this country, this movement away from free speech. And I, I go back to a short time ago, free speech was mainstream in this country. President Obama went to Facebook's Palo Alto headquarters in 2012 and gave a speech praising the free flow of information over the internet. It talked about it being vital to a healthy democracy. Flash forward, a couple miles down the road, a couple years, um, this year, 2022, President Obama, just down the road in uh, Stanford, gave a speech where he talked about um, this free flow of information being a threat to democracy. Uh, and what happened in, in the interim? I personally have some theories. I think some of it goes back to the 2016 election and people thinking that free expression doesn't align with their preferred outcomes at the ballot box. We have to return, again, outside of the FCC, I think, as a country, to this cultural embrace of free expression. It was a mainstream, progressive view for 50 or 60 years. You know, John Oakes, the editor of the New York Times back in the 1950s, said that diversity of opinion is the lifeblood of democracy. The moment we insist that everybody think the same way we do, our democratic way of life is in danger. And I think that's where we've come to. So we need to embrace free speech. And it's a false choice to say you get free speech, and that necessarily means you know, you're going to get terrorist content and child porn and cesspool content. You know, there's a wide, wide gulf between the two where you can protect core political speech, respect other people's views, um, and, and not do that. So I think we can have pro-speech reforms. Uh, and I think Congress should legislate in this space to help us move back in that direction. All right, well, well, effective use of that blank, and, <laughs> and, and thank you for kidding me on national television. Yeah. We can now go to the questions. Uh, we have one right there, and uh, the microphone will be coming to you. And if you could please uh, identify yourself and state your question. Yes, my name is Sharon Bovad. I'm Voice of a Moderate. I'm starting Freedom from Technology. 
A lot of people that, when you, I'm so grateful you brought up the Twitter because you brought it up briefly and then we've talked about infrastructure, but a lot of the people, 70% in a new study of Americans know what the word shadow banning is. The concern amongst the shadow band is that the boycotters that are calling for a boycott with Elon Musk purchasing Twitter, that they will not be shadow banned because protests that they've done in the past have been shadow banned, they could not make their point even though they had hundreds of thousands of people. So when you talk about it being a free speech issue, it has. A segment of society has been muzzled. Now, what they're saying is, is the free, um, the FCC has been brought into the Twitter dialogue. Well, where was the FCC when a lot of people did not have the freedom to tweet, and now that, that, that freedom is changing, the people that enjoyed the uh, chance to have their dialogue, can you please explain that, thank and you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Where was the FCC? It's a good question, trust me. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I think a lot of people right now, um, there's been some requests, for instance, that the FCC step in and try to block Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter. There's calls to get the FTC uh, to step in as well, and from my perspective, what we're seeing is not request for neutral application of competition or antitrust law. I mean, heck, these letters cite to the Telegraph Act of 1860 in, a, in sort of a desperate effort to invoke some basis for the FCC to step in and block uh, a transaction. What I think is going on is a lot of these groups um, are very happy with the type of uh, political censorship that's taking place right now, uh, and they want to try to avoid a pro-speech movement. So I think there's, there's room for people to take action. Again, I think you know, Republican leader uh, McMorse Rogers has laid out a game plan. Uh, Kevin McCarthy has put together, you know, a big tech task force. And I think people are, are very committed to this idea of protecting the digital town square. At the end of the day, Twitter, Facebook, these entities, they have First Amendment rights. And we have to approach this cognizant of their First Amendment rights and the free speech rights of ordinary Americans. But we've done this before. If you go back to the 1990s, um, Congress passed the Cable Act. And at the time, cable was viewed as such a, a core medium that you had to be there, particularly for broadcasters to stay you know, uh, economically relevant. And so we took the editorial discretion that cable providers have of choosing what channels to carry, um, and we regulated that right, and effectively through must carry and other things, require them to carry certain channels. And I think that's a right analogy for us to look for. You can distinguish the analogy, but at the end of the day, we can respect you know, Twitter and Facebook, their First Amendment rights, their right to speak, but put some common sense pro-speech guardrails in place, and I, and I think that's where we need to head. All right, um, very quickly, is there, if there's any response there, otherwise we'll go to the next question, and there, right here, and then we'll go back out there. Good morning, my name's Philip Macris. Um, so I have a question about this concept of waste, fraud, and abuse. I know people look at that, hey, that might be an abstract issue, but it's a real issue, and it really needs to be policed. Uh, there was an article that was posted by Adam Bednar recently in the Communications Daily uh, about a Delaware program using ARPA funds. $55 million uh, went to uh, applicants who were just incumbent cable TV providers, small providers, minority providers, uh, other incoming uh, novel innovative providers were not allowed to participate in that. And in addition, there was an area that was covered by RDOF for at least Seven, uh, 7,500 locations of the 11,500 locations. So the incumbents, they got about $4,800 um, per location. We, we've got less than a minute left okay. if, if we could just and, 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 this And the RDOC provider got a 1,700. What is the FCC, what should government be doing on a real-time basis to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse? Yeah, there's a lot there. One thing I'll say is where we have, you know, RDOC winners in an area, we should not be having bead funding be open to other people to come in and overbuild them. If we have additional dollars that we want to get a faster build from an RDOC winner or a higher speed from an RDOC winner, then I say let's let them top up, but we shouldn't be coming in over the top with federal dollars on top uh, of RDOC winners. And we need to empower our inspector general to make sure they have all the tools necessary to, to ferret this out. The only thing I will say to that is we're out of time, but the only thing I will, you know, will say to that is um, I, I think competition should be robust, and I don't think we should not, in terms of the government, uh, you know, consider uh, competitive forces when we make decisions. All right. Well, thank you. That concludes this blockbuster conversation by our FCC commissioners. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for attending. Thank you. Thank you for participating.